Come with me if you want to live. Rolling Stone raves. Terminator Genesis fires on all cylinders. Hang on! Arnold Schwarzenegger kicks ass. I've been waiting for you. It's everything you want in a summer blockbuster. You gotta get him off me! You could have shot me. Stop whining. And James Cameron declares you will love this movie. I'll be back. Terminator Genesis, now playing in Real D 3D and IMAX 3D. Rated PG-13. May be inappropriate for children under 13. Directed by Alan Taylor. Blog Talk Radio. everyone and welcome to King Jordan Radio. Tonight on the show we'll be discussing testimony from the James Home Myrtle trial. Tonight on the show we'll talk about uh, Senator James out in another county, what he had to say basically uh, about gays. We'll talk about that issue. As you know, uh, it was legalized marriage um, last week. And we'll talk about uh, an inmate who got away and thinks that this whole thing with the two men uh, almost getting away with it uh, was definitely in-house. And tonight we're honored to have, going into the holidays, he is a CNN slash HLN legal analyst, not to mention a great defense attorney. I'm talking about the one and only Double J, Joey Jackson. Good evening, Joey, and welcome to King Jordan Radio. King Jordan, a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. Love your program. Continue to do what you do. You're a real fighter for justice, and I uh, always love to join you, my friend. Thank you so much, and happy uh, ho- early holidays for you and your fam on the uh, coming up on this uh, 4th of July. Where does the time go? Independence Day, right? You know, a couple of days, and uh, we're celebrating independence. So uh, where does the summer go? Where does the time go? That's why we have to make every single bit of use of the great time that we have this gift called life. So uh, let us all do that. It does go by fast indeed. And uh, what didn't go by, the well, it did go by uh, pretty long. Uh, they have a show called They Almost Got Away With It. I don't know if you heard of it or not, but <laughs> and I think David Sweat will be on the next uh, series of it. Let's hear from uh, an escaped uh, guy. Uh, excuse me. Let's hear from an ex- a former convict from the New York State, courtesy of the great CNN. And I want to get your take uh, on what he says about this uh, so-called escape uh, in New York. Absolutely. We'll give you a look. You can see right here, um, there's a police checkpoint. Um, As more law enforcement come here, they're going to want to talk to him. They're going to want to interview him. They are going to look to find out as much as possible about what happened uh, prior to the escape, who was involved, who was complicit, uh, how did they survive for over three weeks out in this wilderness, six million acres of wilderness here in the Northwoods in the Adirondacks. Uh, so this uh, hospital is very secure. Uh, they want him to survive. They wanted him uh, to be caught alive, and they were successful. Um, we believe no other officers were injured uh, in the apprehension, and they've got him alive, and they're going to want to interrogate him, find out again, how did they do it, who was involved, 
Uh, were there other um, uh, uh, jail officers involved other than Joyce Mitchell and Gene Palmer? Mm -hmm. We know of those two, but were there others? Uh, it seems like uh, a lot of people knew about the alleged sexual relationship that the two, or maybe at least one of them, had with Joyce Mitchell. What else did they know about what was going on? And there's going to be a very close look at the conditions at that prison. Why were they allowed so much freedom on the honor block? Why were they allowed to have hot plates? Why were they allowed uh, not to be checked upon every hour with a light? And why were there allegedly two... Uh, towers unattended on the night of the escape. Paige? That's what's just amazing. I want everybody to get a look at the cheering that we were talking about. Uh, Mike Cronin, he's our, at our affiliate WPTZ. Earlier he was reporting and we could see people cheering. If we can throw that up for everybody to take a look at that. We're just outside the entrance of the Alice Hyde Medical Center right behind me here. You see police and troopers and also some people out here gathered to check exactly what's going on out here. But uh, as I said earlier, uh, we're up in uh, Route 122 and Route 30, and that's where we saw two ambulances as well as several uh, troopers and police cars heading south towards Malone here. And uh, Steve's going to flip around and show you what's going on right here. People applauding as now some of the law enforcement driving off and heading down towards the, uh, the entrance of the hospital there. Uh, certainly a, a joyous mood around here from folks, a, a sense of relief from people here as uh, we have learned that David Sweat has been shot and captured. Yes, a big sigh of relief for everybody up there. I want to bring in Jim Cavanaugh. All right, Joey, uh, two things. How important it is that they kept uh, one at least alive to give testimony about the so-called uh, helpers, uh, uh, the lady that was uh, brought in. So uh, one part question is how part, how important is it that they got one and how important is it that they kept him alive for his testimony? Sure. Well, first of all, kudos to law enforcement. Uh, they got their man. They really did. They worked long and hard. Uh, you know, certainly the state police in conjunction with local law enforcement agencies, federal agencies, and really the community who gave the police an awful lot of tips in terms of sightings and potential sightings and where they can be. And, you know, it's so interesting. You always say, if you see something, say something. And that doesn't only relate and apply to terrorism, of course. It applies to any act of, you know, illegality, including an escape. And so you have to give the police credit where it's due. Uh, you know, three weeks or not, they ultimately got them. And I think it ensures the, the community is a lot less anxious. Uh, they're sleeping a lot better tonight. And uh, I think, you know, it instills public confidence, certainly, when you have these people under control. Now, in terms of having one alive, as we know, uh, you know, the other was shot in the head the Friday preceding uh, the capture of Sweat. And therefore, that's, uh, that inmate Matt, he was shot and killed on Friday, uh, you know, prior to them getting Sweat on Sunday. Uh, and so... Right. You know, it is important to have one of the inmates alive so that they can speak, but I do want to caution. And the caution is, you know, you want to debrief this particular inmate. You want to find out what happened, how it happened, when it happened, why it happened, who it happened with, who potentially was involved, inmates, civilians, correction officers. But I don't think you want to be in a position, and the police know this, but just for the benefit, you know, cer certainly of listeners, you don't want to be in a position of just accepting his word as gospel. Uh, we're talking about a murderer, a convicted killer, an inmate, and I don't know how much honor or decency there is in that. And so while it's important to find out exactly what occurred, to ask the right questions, to get the right answers, uh, and to certainly rely upon his cooperation, and certainly it appears as though he's been talking, you want to make sure that you vet very, very clearly and very, very thoroughly exactly what he tells you. What if he has a vendetta against officers who he didn't like, against civilians he didn't like, and just wants to talk on that basis? And so that whatever he says, take with a grain of salt and make sure that you research it very carefully and corroborate it in order to ensure that he's not telling tall tales. Uh, and so, you know, certainly to the extent that he could give any information that they can corroborate, I think you can use that to make reforms within the system. And make no mistake about it, there will be massive reforms inside that jail. 
uh, I think from bottom up uh, in terms of, you know, what housing areas they keep, how often the inmates are checked on, what you allow the inmates to do, the noise levels in the facility, uh, the, the amount of times actually that the inmates have to report themselves and correction officers have to check on them, the entirety of the system is, has been called into question, and I think reforms will be put in place so that this doesn't happen again. Now, we heard uh, rumors that uh, the lady got scared and she uh, didn't uh, go ahead and meet them when they uh, got out. Now, uh, assuming she is found guilty, right now she's alleged, but if, assuming if she is found guilty, the fact that she didn't go through with it, does that maybe possibly uh, diminish her punishment? You know, it's a great question, and I think that a few things have to be looked at. Obviously, when you look at the criminal justice system, you have to look at what you do here. And what you do is you look at a threefold model. One is the punishment, uh, and obviously you want to punish conduct like this because you don't want people helping inmates uh, or anybody else, uh, really, who's going to engage in any crime. And escaping is certainly a crime, particularly when you're that dangerous and can endanger so much, so many people. The next thing, though, is deterrence. You want to make sure that whatever you do uh, to Miss Joyce, in addition to the other correction officer who has been arrested and is our co-defendant, you want to make sure that you deter not only them from doing it again, but other people who are correction officers or civilians within a jail for them to do it again. And then, of course, the last of the three tenets would be rehabilitation. You know, you would hope that any criminal could be rehabilitated, except for, you know, murderers, but, you know, certainly Joyce and Palmer, who's the correction officer co-defendant, are, are not murdered, and they can. So those are the three things you look at. But you want to balance that, and we know that the facilitating contraband or promoting prison contraband in the first degree is a deep felony punishable by seven years. We also know that the criminal facilitation, which is the assisting, the aiding, and abetting of the actual escape by providing the, you know, the means for them to do so with the drill bits and other things, that's a misdemeanor punishable by up to one year. So... The bottom line, though, is that you want to, at the same time, recognize, if you're the prosecutor, their cooperation. And the reason that you have to recognize that cooperation and, to some degree, uh, allow that to be a lessening factor, a mitigating factor, something that reduces the punishment, is because you want to send a signal, not that people should ever engage in crime, they shouldn't, but that there is some type of benefit to cooperating with authorities. You want people in the future, in the event that they unfortunately commit crimes, to cooperate, to tell what they know, to aid, to assist, and to provide any information on law enforcement or to law enforcement to get matters under control. And so I think the prosecutor is going to have to look at that very carefully in assessing what punishment should be given here. Yes, the punishment should be stiff. This is not something we can tolerate, but it certainly needs to be balanced with the extent to which she did have a change of heart, she did cooperate, and she did provide information uh, that was, you know, relevant and important in the police capturing and subduing and bringing at least one of them into custody. Absolutely. Dr. Rose Marie uh, Magnos uh, said that the results showed that James Holmes was not faking his make, uh, mental illness. Let's hear some testimony, and I want to get your take on the other side. When you conduct these kinds sure. of tests, and it may have occurred you know, to anybody here who is, is listening to talk about testing in the context of a criminal forensic case, the first question that comes to mind across the board in every case that has to be answered is, is the person faking? Are they feigning or malingering mental, mental disease or defect? Um, in order to achieve a desired legal goal. So that has to be answered. So we have tests that we use that help us determine whether someone is feigning or faking problems in their thinking. Okay. And are these tests um, validated somehow prior to you using them? I oh. mean, how, where do they come up with these tests? Sure, where do they come up with these tests? They, they're validated typically in two different ways. So there's a lot of research that gets done on them before they're put into practice. They're validated in one way, what we call on known groups, um, like we have people who, it's a research study where one group of people is being instructed to fake problems and another group of people is instructed to answer the tests accurately and often they're being paid in order to, both sides, in order to facilitate motivation to do their job right, in other words, take the test properly or fake. And then <clears throat> differences are looked at. 
And it's also, uh, these tests are validated on clinical samples. So there might be a large, there might be a group of people who, like, a team of psychiatrists has determined is feigning or faking, and then a group of people that a team of psychiatrists or psychologists has determined is not. And then you see how they perform on this test, and you get cutoff scores for different types of feigning or faking. It, that, that almost sounds like there's like an objective measure of the of the test or that there it's an objective way of comparing the test results against other individuals in a population is that the way it works sure there are a number of these tests you end up with objective scores that allow you to make a make a call on and there's no one test that's going to answer that that's why we do several as a rule okay okay um what kind of validity testing did you do uh, with mr holmes yes i did several i did the test of memory malingering it's often called the tom and that's a test to determine whether someone is feigning or faking memory problems for new information. And um, how did he respond on the, uh, on the TOM? He performed normally with no evidence of feigning or faking. Okay. Now, is, are these infallible, these tests? Mm, is is no. it absolutely impossible to beat the test? No test is infallible, of course not. And it, tests always must be looked at in the context of other test results as well as a clinical uh, examination. Um, so, yeah, no, no, one te no test is infallible, and certainly one would never hang your hat on the results of one test in terms of any of these interpretations. Is that why it's a good idea to do a number of different tests and to do them perhaps at different times? Absolutely. Any other validity testing that you did? Yes, I did. I administered a test called the Validity Indicator Profile, um, shortened for VIP, and that assesses whether someone is feigning or faking problems with reasoning and problem solving for both words and visual material. Okay. And how did Mr. Holmes uh, perform on that test? He performed in the valid compliant range with no evidence of feigning or faking. Um, any other... Um, validity testing that you did? I did the B test, which is another test of uh, whether someone is faking cognitive problems, and he performed in the normal effort range. So you're talking about faking symptoms of mental illness as well as not trying very hard on the test? No, this would be uh, the, the mental illness piece I will leave to Dr. Gray. Okay. This would be feigning or faking cognitive problems, like pretending I can't think straight in terms of solving a basic problem, when in fact I can or pretending or faking that I can't remember what you've just told me, when in fact I can. So it's thinking skills as opposed to psychotic symptoms. Any indication, a any other validity testing that you did? Those were the tests that I administered. Um, and what were the conclusions, if any, that you drew from this validity testing that you did about Mr. Holmes' effort and, and potential faking in the course of this testing? And my test results in conjunction with my clinical interview led me to the conclusion that his effort uh, and cooperation were adequate during testing. And, and why do you incorporate the clinical interview in that opinion, ma'am? Well, I, I always look at behavior observations. Of course, no clinician is infallible. No psychologist or psychiatrist can always see through people. But, you know, having done many, many evaluations of, you know, certainly a lot of them in the criminal forensic realm, you see a lot of people who do feign and they fake symptoms and problems and deficits they don't have. So I need to be on the lookout, if you will, for those kinds of behaviors uh, in order to supplement um, the, the test results. Sounds like you really keep your eye open for this stuff. I always do. It's part of my job. Um, in your expert opinion, then, is there any reason that this jury or anyone else should be concerned about whether Mr. Holmes was putting forth a good effort in, or faking in, in this context? In this context, not at all, no. Okay, Joey Jackson, what do you make of the testimony that prosecutors used for, uh, to uh, go against uh, uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Rose Marie, and how important is that testimony to show the jury a uh, specific sure. thing that he was not faking it? This is the defense, of course. And what happens is, let's, just, let's, yeah, let's talk about three things. The first thing is what was noted in that direct examination, which is where the defense asked questions of the expert, and that's the obvious thing, is that this is not an exact science. And as not being an exact science, nothing's infallible, and certainly any system could be gamed. 
So not let's not take the conclusion that he wasn't faking it with absolute certainty. Certainly, as she admitted on the stand, you know, there's no test that's infallible. Certainly something could be faked or overcome. But the second and most, more important thing than that, before I get to the third, is that there's a distinction between mental illness and faking mental illness and insanity. There's a major distinction between the two. You can be mentally ill but not insane. And so I don't really have any doubt, quite frankly, having followed the trial, having looked at what he did, that he has some mental illness. The guy was a problems person. I think that anybody who could, you know, dress up as he did uh, and go into a movie theater and buy Glocks and guns and, you know, AK-47s and do all this booby trap his house so that when the police went to it after, you know, they might be injured. Anybody who kills 12 people and injures 70 is mentally ill, in my view. Uh, so that's not the issue. The issue is whether he was sane. And if you look at insanity, as that definition is defined in most jurisdictions, in particular we're talking about Colorado, did he know right from wrong? Mm -hmm. That's the question. And in the event that he did know right from wrong, he gets another bite of the apple, which is irresistible impulse. Even if he did, could he help himself? Could he form the mental state? And, of course, as we know, just as an aside, in Colorado it's one of 11 states where the state, the prosecutor has to prove sanity beyond a reasonable doubt. In the other jurisdictions, the defense has to take it upon themselves to show that their client was insane, and they have to establish that. In this jurisdiction, very important, the prosecution must show that he's sane. Now, be that as it may, again, you can't tell me that someone who does all, engages in all the acts of premeditation, meaning going and purchasing the weapons that he purchased uh, in planning to do what he did, in putting on a vest, in dressing up, in going to a theater, in making the you know cognitive decision to open fire and shoot and kill people and then stay and surrender to the police and then tell the police he booby-trapped his home. I, that seems to me that that's pretty planned, premeditated, and thought out. And so no matter what you say in terms of his mental, mental illness and whether he's faking it, fine. He may not be faking mental illness, but I think it's another burden to establish whether he was insane. And I just don't think that the defense will be able to establish that. The final thing that we should point out regarding that testimony is that, you know, in math they say that there are lies and statistics. Well, in criminal trials there are experts and there are experts. And so if you listen to the experts that testified on behalf of the prosecution in their case, he knew exactly, that is, the defendant here, the murderer here, knew exactly what he was doing. And he was, without question, saying when he did what he did. Now you have the defense experts who are saying the opposite. He's insane, not faking, mentally ill, knows what he's doing, doesn't know what he's doing, excuse me. So now you have a battle of the experts, and it's left up to a jury when you have conflicting experts to use their common sense and good judgment. And I think on balance, once they evaluate the nature of what he did, how he did it, I think it's a very, very difficult uh, burden for the defense really to overcome. It's a major hurdle. And that is, I think the jury will conclude that he knew what he was doing. He plotted it, premeditated it. They'll find him guilty. And the other thing is, I mean, there are lives here that are lost. There are lives that have been changed forever. And I think that's going to weigh very, very heavily on a jury's mind. So was he mentally ill? Did he need therapy? Was he a problem person? Yes. Did he send his uh, therapist uh, essentially, you know, a document asserting that he just, his mind was broken and, a, you know, a document and a book describing who he was and what he did? Yes. But I just don't know that that meets the definition for insanity. In fact, I believe it does not. And I think he'll ultimately be found guilty. Let me ask you a question now. Based on the uh, recent social media and death threats to uh, the juror who did not vote death in the recent uh, the recent retry of Jody Arias, now I do not think that he's uh, uh, innocent by any stretch but I do want the system to work. 
do you fear in any way with people, uh, jurors, in fact, even though they're taking out in the back of their minds saying to themselves, I've got to find this defendant uh, guilty because if I don't, I'm going to have to deal with death threats. I might have to move out of the area. Do you, are you worried a little bit of what's going on with uh, Juror 17, to, to use an example? What happened with some of the jurors with Casey Anthony? Uh, it seems to be a trend with the social media. Your thoughts? Well, it's a great question because we do live in a different day and age where you do have social media, which allows us to communicate readily with people within our state, without our state, within another country. Uh, and you certainly, through social media, can expose various things about people, good things and bad things. And so you want to always protect the integrity of the system. You don't want jurors to be influenced by the public. The juror has sat there, has evaluated the case, and it's presumably use their common sense and good judgment in reaching a conclusion. And so, you know, certainly you're concerned and you want to provide as much cover and protection for jurors to do the right thing and to base decisions not on what the public will think but what the evidence shows. And in a day and age of social media, certainly we have to be more mindful of that and we have to do a better job of protecting a jury. And whether that means that, you know, we make them anonymous, I think the media does, a fairly good job at, you know, not focusing on jurors, not depicting jurors until after the fact. And then even after the fact, the juror is welcome to come and talk to the media, but not required to do so. And so certainly, you know, we need to continue to protect jurors, and we shouldn't be threatening or, you know, in any way abusing jurors. But when jurors do things that are against the notions of fair play, uh, it, it makes people question why they did that. And sometimes people go over the top in doing that questioning, and they convert it into a threat, which is completely wrong. But uh, a lot of people follow this. As you know, you're a great follower of trials, and many people, you get wedded to a trial. It's like a soap opera of sorts. Every day something's going on, and you just really hope and pray the juror does the right thing. And I think that's the tenor of the country and the people that watch. They want jurors to do the right thing and to serve for the right reasons. And when they don't, it offends our notions of fair play and justice. And that's what you see happening. Okay, finally, Republican Senator James of Oklahoma had some interesting things to say about the uh, recent gay marriage that was uh, just uh, handed to us. Let's take a listen to this, and we'll get your take on the other side. Senator Jim Inhofe is a very conservative Republican from Oklahoma, uh, and he does not like the decision the Supreme Court uh, laid down on uh, gay marriage. He's been against gay marriage all like traditional marriage. But then he went a little further and said this. We have, we've, uh, I've been disappointed, and, uh, and I, I was not surprised. I felt that they would rule the way they did. And uh, I know a lot of people, actually, a lot of people and their friends of mine in the gay community who also think it was a bad, uh, a bad decision. <laughs> Come on, dog. Come on. Really? You have a lot of friends in the gay community? Okay, let me call bullshit on that right away. Okay. Second of all, your friends in the gay community can say, oh, man, Senator Inhofe, I've got to tell you, man, the thing that gave me equal rights to you, that decision, oh, I hate that. Yeah, you're so right, man. I shouldn't have equal rights to you. Although if Senator Inhofe does have any gay friends, they probably would say that. And they'd probably be fellow Republican senators. In fact, is there a guy in the South somewhere who's a Republican senator, would have a rotating first lady if he were to win the presidency, and that might be a friend of Senator Inhofe. Hey, perhaps he does have gay friends. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just asking the question. In fact, Senator Inhofe, uh, I'm sure that they are very proud, out and proud, both to be gay and to be your friend. So can you go ahead and do us a favor and name a single gay friend you have? We've got a poll up right now on the TYT app. You just go to App Store, type in TYT. Senator Jim Inhofe says many of his gay friends are disappointed with the uh, Supreme Court's decision to approve gay marriage. Do you believe him? So far, there's over 600 votes, and that was before we even went to air. The <laughs> percentages are 98 to 2. Don't believe him. <laughs> totally and utterly full of crap. But hey, the polling's still open. Go to the TYT app and participate. But Senator Inhofe, if you'd like to have any credibility, okay, put the snowballs down and show us one single gay friend you have and have him come out and say, oh, man, I hated the Supreme Court decision giving me uh, equal rights to straights.
I dare you. Of course there is no such person. You are completely and utterly full of crap. And if that person exists, he is in a deep, deep Republican closet. Okay, Joey, our final story. What do you make of this senator? Uh, I mean, you know, certainly everyone's entitled to their own opinion in terms of him having a friend who would suggest that they don't agree with the decision. I find that hard to believe. If I had to vote uh, along in that poll, I think it would be far-fetched for him to have, you know, such a friend. Uh, And, you know, quite frankly, I just think, you know, from a broader perspective, you know, the time has come. We can all have our opinions, our points of views, but the Supreme Court is the ultimate law of the land. We need to respect it. The reality is, is that, you know, gay and lesbians should be afforded equal protections like everybody else. And that's what the court said. And I'm just not sure how you disagree. You know, I, I understand that people have their views on gay, lesbian rights, but in terms of the logic of the decision, briefly, Jordan, the court said two things. That one, it's a fundamental right. That is, marriage is a fundamental right recognized by the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. And number two, that gay and lesbians are entitled to equal protection under the law like everyone else. So I'm not entirely sure why that logic is bad or wrong or that you would be disagreeing with it. So the senator's comments don't make any sense, meaning... You can have your views. You can disagree with me in terms of whether I believe gay and lesbians should have, should have rights like everyone else. That's fine. Be, feel free to disagree. But in terms of the lo- logic and reasoning that the court used, they logically concluded that, that marriage is a fundamental right, which gay and lesbians should have, which is recognized by the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause, and that gay and lesbians should have equal protections like everyone else. From a logical perspective, how do you assail that? How do your friends that are gay or lesbian, according to the senator, disagree with those propositions? So I, you know, I, I'm not getting where the senator comes from, but I think the time has come. The 14th Amendment has been used for a variety, wide range of things throughout history. We can look at segregation and the fact of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, and how, based upon the Supreme Court's ruling in that case, separate but equal, which was the law of the land, was overturned. And the 14th Amendment, you know what, has been used throughout history to correct wrongs. And I think it's been wrong, uh, you know, to exclude gay and lesbians from marriage. And the time has come. So God bless gay, lesbian, straight, marry who you want. Love is the message. Love is the word. Absolutely. And I did want to give a shout out to the uh, one and only Madeline. Maddie, she does a great job, and uh, so that's that, and I wanted to wish you a happy uh, fourth. Hopefully, the Yankees could turn it around. We're a little on a losing <laughs> streak. They won yesterday. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I but, certainly uh, hope they do. I hope the Yankees turn it around. My, you know, my Bronx Bombers, they gotta, they have to represent. So, you know, they're a great team. They'll put it together, and so I wish them well. Maddie's fabulous. Sharon's been ailing a little bit, but, uh, you know, she's resilient. She's tough. We wish her well, and she's one of a kind, as, uh, you know, are all of the people out there who were just, you know, so supportive and just phenomenal. I mean, you know, one of the great things about doing this is you really get to see people's true colors, and you get to see who, who, you know, the genuine nature of people. We get to cover a lot of bad stories, you and I, and we get to do right. a lot of terrible trials and things that go on. But one of the things that's a constant is what we see every day, and that's the goodness of people that you and I deal with in the Maddies and the Sharons, you know, and in so many people that are like them that it's it's incredible. It's a joy to have, you know, people who are just such such genuine, solid people, no matter the race, no matter the color, no matter the age, you know, people are people. And um, we get to see the best of it. So in these Horrific times where we try to do justice and we talk about justice. <laughs> Remember that uh, there's a there's a great group of people out there who are looking to do justice every day. And Sharon and uh, Maddie are at the top of the list now. As are you, my when friend. We... <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> when can we see you on CNN next? I'll be on tomorrow at noon, uh, and uh, I'll be on Saturday in the morning starting at uh, 6.30 a.m., And, uh, you know, Sunday we'll see. Maybe I'll sleep in Sunday or maybe I won't. (laughs) 
Okay, so, are you going to uh, a, a barbecue at the uh, Jackson re- residence? Is there any barbecuing we're gonna, going on? We're going to barbecue. We got the, you know, we got the burgers, the steak. We got the lobsters, the shrimp. We're going to have everything flowing. Lobsters. And, uh, oh, my goodness you know, gracious. <laughs> and hopefully I'll, I'll uh, sit it. down, kick, kick back. I'll have my sandals on, and it'll be a very nice time. So, you know, enjoy your independence. Summer goes day. quick, you know that. <laughs> Summer goes really very quick. Does. It really does. <laughs> Have a beautiful so, weekend, Joe. Bless God bless. Thanks so much for everything, okay? Keep doing the great work you do. You really inform a lot of people, and I'm very proud of you, and I'm always, always pleased to be able uh, to be on your show and to get the great invitation to join you and to hash out the issues. Well, those words mean a lot coming from somebody like you. I really appreciate it. Thank Talk you. to you soon, Joe. Thank you much. Peace, love, and happiness. Thanks. All right, folks, thanks to the great Joey Jackson. You heard that he will be on uh, CNN tomorrow at high noon on the East Coast and 6.30 on the CNN. And uh, next week, uh, hopefully, we'll have Aphrodite Jones and Alex Sanchez. So uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed yourself. Um, Definitely... uh, uh, follow us on the Twitter at Mr. King Jordan R A D, and uh, we will uh, speak to you soon. Good night, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week.